Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Alison Johnston, MSP. I represent Lothian in the Parliament, which includes Edinburgh, of course, and I'm presiding officer of the Parliament for this session, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to the 2024 Festival of Politics. So pleased that you're here to join us today to take part in this conversation with award-winning actor Jack Loudon. And I'm really pleased too that the event is brought in partnership with the Scottish Youth Film Foundation. And if you're keen to share any thoughts or comments on social media, you can do so using the at Visit Scott Parle account via Instagram. Look forward to catching up with them later. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Jack just now. And that's for those of you who don't know. And I don't know what it's like to sit there and hear someone tell you your own life story, but here we go. <laughs> okay, I'll keep it briefish. So, Jack is a graduate from the Scottish Royal Academy of Music and Drama in Glasgow. He was brought up in Oxton, attended Erlston High School, where I believe he played the part of a buddy holly yes. at a young age. <laughs> now, you may know him currently as River Cartwright in the excellent Apple TV hit thriller Show Horses. See, things I never thought I'd be seeing in the Scottish Parliament. <laughs> um, and that's about a group of British spies presided over by their, I think, probably truly unique boss, Gary Oldman, with whom River enjoys a, shall we say, somewhat robust working relationship. Yeah. Um, and it's about to return for a fourth series in September. Um, Jack joined the Scottish Youth Theatre at the age of 10, I believe, and I think we'd all want to thank his parents for <laughs> making sure that that happened. Um, and he's taken part, I think it's really important that I mention this, that you were John in Peter Pan in Edinburgh's King's, King's Theatre, you know, a real Edinburgh institution. And you're about to open this week in the Lyceum mm -hmm. in the play The Fifth Step with the National Theatre of Scotland. And that's a company you first worked with on the Seminole Black Watch production some years ago. And I believe, too, that that play was a real catalyst for your desire to do what you're doing currently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Jack's not only content, though, to be contributing in theatre um, at this year's Edinburgh Festival. He's also co-producer of the film adaptation of Amy Liptrot's powerful memoir, The Outrun which is the opening film in this year's Edinburgh International Film Festival. And I think it's um, worthy of note that Jack's co-producer is his now wife, Saoirse Ronan, and they were recently married here in Edinburgh. <laughs> so congratulations to you. So Jack's packed a heck of a lot into his career to date, whether that's playing the World War I poet Seafred Sassoon in the film Benediction, or the lead as Morrissey in the biopic England is Mine, the fighter pilot in Christopher Nolan's World War II adventure Dunkirk. He's been recognised for his role in Steve McQueen's small axe drama in the comedy drama Fighting With My Family, as well as his role as the Olympic gold medal winning Eric Liddell in the stage adaptation of Chariots of Fire. I mean, Eric Liddell was obviously so much more than an athlete, and I think that's clear in the work that you have done in we heard, if you haven't seen it, we have a very good um, exhibition downstairs just now, um, you know, detailing his work and that of other Scottish sports people. And Jack was cast in the stage adaptation of Chariots of Fire by Barbara Broccoli, the producer behind the James Bond films. And yeah, you know where I'm going next, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just wait and see on that one. You know what I'm saying. However, Jack is currently very, very busy indeed. Um, he has a list of awards and nominations that are just far too long to read out here, but very well deserved. He has won the Ian Charleston Award, the Laurence Olivier Award, two British Academy Scotland Awards. But I believe that there are times when you're not working, obviously you're dog walking, and you are kayaking and enjoying swimming, open water swimming, I believe. Um, or watching your favourite comedy series, Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, all, please welcome Jack Loudon. <laughs> so, Jack and I have had a little chat, and I have told him that 
Sparks. No holds barred questions on anything. <laughs> Just, you know, shoot from the hip. And he's, he's um, <laughs> not agreed. <laughs> so... No, he just laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I mentioned earlier that you co-produced the film adaptation. I'm going to put some questions to Jack and then we're going to open to you. So this is going to be a really interactive session. God. But I <laughs> <laughs> that was terrifying, that intro. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know why. I, as I was saying earlier, this is neither of our day jobs. <laughs> but I, I think Jack's going to be doing a lot of this from now on, so <laughs> he can look back on this interview and thank me. <laughs> <laughs> and you. And you. Anyway, I mentioned earlier that you co-produced the film adaptation of Amy Liptrot's memoir, The Outrun, about her life in London yep. and her return to home in Orkney. And um, I think it'd just be good to hear what drew you to this book, you know, in particular, and the idea of producing the film. Um, well, I, I, I read that book in lockdown um, when I remember specifically, I used to live in Leith, so I, I, I read it there. Um, and, you know, the, the difference between the streets of Leith and the sort of Orcadian sort of sparseness was sort of really appealing during lockdown, as probably everybody can kind of relate to being locked indoors like that. So um, it became a great outlet, that book, and I f also felt that the character of Amy Liptrot, her journey of, of sort of self-healing and, and, and the magnificent lesson and sort of hope that no matter how low you bring yourself or others bring you, you know, that there's always a way of rebuilding yourself. Um, and I just thought it would be a magnificent story for people to become more familiar with and also a wonderful part for, for Sersha to play that I knew is something that she could nail and do standing on her head which she can do with most things so um, <laughs> it basically grew from there, we found out another producer had the book, had the rights, we approached them, you sort of cosy up and you go oh, we could do this and so we, we all joined together and, and um, we sort of built the team from there and, and ended up in Orkney which was wonderful and this is your second film production, is that right, with Kindred being the first? I'm just wondering how challenging it is to get an independent film off the oh, ground yes. and, and what insights it might give you as an actor. It's a nightmare and <laughs> it's a miracle that any independent film is made. Um, uh, I, 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 I first pushed myself into that side of stuff because I found being an actor, um, there was a lot of inactivity and it was actually quite boring being on a film set <laughs> sometimes because <laughs> you sort of sit in your little house, your little trailer thing um, and everybody else seems to be more busy than you. Um, and if I'm not busy, I'll, I, I'll just think and that's no use for anybody. <laughs> so um, producing really became, was born out of a sort of selfish intent to, to sort of quiet my own head and sort of be useful. Um, and that's what happened with Kindred, and then that rolled into the outrun. Um, and it also put in perspective how I feel about acting and how much I kind of, uh, I, I want to keep doing that or not. Um, and it just, it, it, I, I would advise that for anybody in the arts. If there ever becomes an opportunity where you can be involved in the arts in a different way than you want to be, is that you see the whole thing, whether it's, a musician or whatever, you know, if, if you spend some time on a sound desk or whatever, you see it from a different angle, it will do nothing but serve what you really want to do. It will serve it so well because it will frame how you are, how you are seen by the other departments because the arts is a, a hugely, well, it's like politics, it's a hugely collaborative um, thing. So um, I, I, I've loved doing it. And we're speaking about, you know, where you are now and the opportunities that present themselves and, and will continue to do so, but I'm just interested to learn about how you found being involved in this business over a long time. I mean, some people may just be hearing about, you know, you've obviously been involved in one way or another for a very long time. I'm interested in, you know, how challenging that is for a young person. You're 10 years old, you watch someone, you think, do you know what, I would love to do that. How was that for you? I mean, I, 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 I do what I do because uh, my, younger, my younger brother, um, who's a ballet dancer, he's a, um, a principal ballet dancer, um, he, him and I watched Michael Flatley's River Dance when we were about, I don't know, whatever. I mean, I don't think we were even double figures. Um, and we both just became obsessed with that out of nowhere and were sort of dancing around in the kitchen or whatever. And 
I sort of followed him into trying out tap dancing. <laughs> we tried out tap dancing, and then he fell into ballet, and he was uh, very, very, very good at it, and I was very, very, very bad at it. <laughs> um, but I, I'd sort of gotten on stage by that point, and I became addicted very quickly to this relationship. This is totally different now. This is terrifying, but <laughs> being, being someone else and sort of making people laugh and whatever became very addictive. Um, so that is how him and I ended up doing what we do. Uh, and we had parents uh, that just really encouraged us to do what, what, whatever we wanted to do. And we were very lucky. And where we went to school down in the borders, you know, there's, actually, there's a great art scene down in the borders. Um, and it's part of, it's, um, it's really, really accepted in the borders of the arts. Um, you know, there's the old joke is that you're either a rugby player, a farmer, or you're in amateur operatics. <laughs> in the borders, it's mad, it's mad that difference. And but they're all sort of the three of them are sort of intrinsically linked. Um, so it's a wonderful, it was a wonderful place to grow up. But for any young person, um, I love the idea that that, that that anything I do makes just one young person want to do it because if you do it and you and, and you're lucky enough, there's a lot of luck. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. <laughs> It really is. Is there anyone in particular that you have looked up to? Um, I mean, countless. Uh, I mean, I I got to work with Peter Mullen when uh, when I was about I when I, was, uh, <laughs> I got to work with him when I was about twenty five years old, and um, I've always thought he was one of the best screen actors in the world. But then learning what Peter's journey was into acting, like I think Peter was a university lecturer in Glasgow at some point um, I think he thought he was going to be a footballer that didn't work out so did I, I thought I was going to be one didn't work out at all um, and he sort of fell into it uh, I found that really inspiring that he didn't set out to do it and so it's never too late either yeah, yeah. no I think that's, that's a very important point, I mean you played the small time criminal Keith Noy in Neil Forsyth's Brilliant um, the gold about the Brinks Matt robbery. Um, you had an impeccable South London accent in that. How how do you go about that? Um, well, I was technically may as well, technically I was born in Essex, <laughs> um, so I've I, there's probably a part of that that's always <laughs> stuck around. <laughs> um, I, so. I, but it probably comes from watching, only, being obsessed by Only Fools and Horses since I was very young. And basically that was my attempt to play Del Boy. And it just, ha just happened to be called Kenneth Noy or whatever. But I, I loved doing that project. And I, I, the irony of it, of it being an incredibly famous South East English story, but it was written by a Dundonian. Um, I loved that. I thought it was very funny. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that that was great. That was a that was a big big challenge. I had to put, but it wasn't the accent. It was I had to put a lot of weight on. <laughs> I put about two two stone on in about seven or eight weeks. So it was a lot of eating and a lot of working out. And yeah, it was that that was knackering. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that is quite a challenge. We were having a wee discussion earlier about Gary Oldman's eating schedule. Um, yeah. In the slow horse season, it's. He you know that's hard. quite demanding, isn't it? He does. I mean, I mean, there's worse jobs than <laughs> <laughs> he really does. He do, I was I was saying earlier, like there's there's scenes where his character's eating an ice cream, and I've watched him eat about eight ice creams because he's done eight ice, and he has to sit down for five minutes out to just <laughs> just let it go down. Yeah, yeah, mad. I certainly find it my own point in life. It's much easier putting it on than taking it off. Yeah, it's easy. Um, but yeah, you're, you're many years ahead of you before that, <laughs> that that happens. I mean, it seems to me that there's so much that's really good coming out of Scotland. You know, we're talking about Neil Forsyth there. There's the success of guilt. We're seeing, you know, folk who went to school in Edinburgh on our screens with some regularity having that great success. I'd just like to be, you know, how buoyant do you think the arts and culture scene is in Scotland at the moment? That's a big question. I mean... I always find there's always a t that there is always a tendency to whenever anybody's asked that question that everybody goes it's rubbish. Everybody in it, wherever you are in the world, you know, arts is always sort of quite far down anybody's agenda in terms of like in terms of importance and things like that. And I, I don't think it's saying anything new when we always that we need we need more money and more space and everything for the arts. But then every other every other aspect of human life would say the same thing. I don't know if there's many aspects of 
of our lives that we go, mm, you could, we could have less money, please, for the buses. You know, you wouldn't say that. So, um, but in terms of the arts in Scotland, I, I am enormously proud of the things that come out of, come out of this country. I'm enormously pr proud of the fact that we are um, develop that we keep developing the muscle of storytelling because I think I might be wrong, right? But <laughs> but growing up, right, is that I always felt this might just be me. I don't know if it's a grown up in Scotland thing. So this is what I'm trying to work out as I get older. Is I always had suffered from quite a bit of embarrassment, right? A sort of like not not wanting to show off is what I would call it. Not wanting to perform. And I know that a lot of the people that I grew up with in the borders, for example, they suffered from that as well. We didn't know about it at the time, but we were all quite shy, I guess is the, the, the sort of right word. And like when I went to the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow, I, um, I could always tell people from the borders or I could always tell people from the Highlands or whatever, is that we were all kind of shy. And only the, the only really Scots that weren't shy were the Glaswegians. <laughs> They, they weren't shy, and I was like, I was like, what? What is this? There's a Scot that's got confidence. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, that is an amazing thing. I was like, it's a rape because we had, we had, you know, the, it's a, it's, you know, the international students like all the great universities up here, you know, Americans, people from down south, from all over the place, and they all, all in general, had a bit more confidence. And um, I used to get really jealous of that because I was like, there's so many great things I wish I, I wanted to do and say and become, but um, there was always a slight sort of like, aye, but didn't he? You know, and I, and I don't know if that's ever... That, that, this is just my opinion, right? I don't know if that's everybody's experience of growing up in Scotland. And I also think there's a wonderful thing in Scotland I'm dis I've discovered as I've gotten older is like, you build, we build those people. We build one wonderful watchers, people that will let you, as, the, as I would say, hang yourself first. <laughs> you know, you, you make an idiot of yourself first. But then we've also made people like, I watched the guy that almost won the silver medal, eh, they almost won the gold medal at the Olympics, Kerr, the runner, who's just so, so confident, so confident. Andy Murray has such unbelievable self-belief. Eh, you know, Alex Ferguson, we build those as well. So I'm, I find it so fascinating about our country that we build pe pe people that are, are not front-footed and then build people that we bulldoze you through a wall. <laughs> and, and I'm very, very, as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm, I used to, it used to frustrate me, the shyness, but I've gotten, as I've gotten older, I've been quite proud of the fact that we breed in, uh, here an environment, we breed all kinds of different people. Um, I've got no idea what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> So hey, you and you, you said something to me before we came in when you said you, your job some most of the days is to keep answers succinct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah but, but, solid. But you know those are particular types right, of answers. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A lot more at stake. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's fascinating. We're here to hear from you and about your experiences. Um, no, I, I think it's probably one that a lot of people who've grown up in Scotland do share. I mean, I, I, I still, if I'm speaking to classes in here, I'll reflect that I think, I often say this to visiting school groups, if my teacher was asked, who in this room is least likely to stand up and speak in the Scottish Parliament? It would have been me, as I hid under my desk, resolutely determined to never put my hand up. So there's something about, yeah, you obviously learn as you go along, but do you think you know, organisations like the Scottish Youth Theatre, like the opportunity to do drama in school and so on, are so important to, to yeah. developing. Uh, my, I mean, the, I, I, my year, uh, the, the guys that I was friends with at high school, at Elston High School, there's about four or five of us that were basically like the in-betweeners, if people know what they are. <laughs> like, just five sort of spotty boys that, that were, you know, like typical teenage boys. And all of them, all four of them, came to amateur operatics with me. One of them went off into the... It, when they left school, one went into the army. I think one became a journalist. One went into sports science. But they spent a large part of their teenage years in amateur operatics with me. And I've always, I've, I've always been so thankful, from a personal point of view, to these four guys that made me seem... It felt, and I can't, this is what annoys me that I'm saying this, is that I was made to feel normal that I wanted to be an actor. And I hate that I have to say that. 
It's like my brother was made to feel normal about being a ballet dancer because slight foot were in amateur operatics. They didn't even raise their eyes at him being a ballet dancer. Um, and I don't, so I don't know why I, I was made to feel like that, but those four guys did that and it's helped them, and it absolutely helped them, their experience of being in front of an audience. But also it, stage in particular teaches you responsibility that obviously, I know, it's not life and death, but the responsibility of a whole group of people trying to create one thing, one perfect thing, perfect even it's Amdram, but perfect thing, and that if you didn't turn up at the right point in the wings, if you don't put your thing, you know, the whole thing falls apart. And also, if things fall apart, learning how to think on your feet. Like, there's, there's so many things working in plays, theatre, shows can teach you that I don't think people think of because they just go, it's arts, it's... It's just running about, looking stupid. <laughs> and it really, really isn't. It really isn't. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely essential, isn't it? And you'll know the Festival of Politics is partnering with Healing Arts Scotland to promote the importance of arts and culture on, on our health, which maybe isn't a link that's often understood. I think we've got a bit better about understanding. You know, we, we know that GPs now will prescribe activity or membership to your local gym or something, but... You know, the importance of arts and culture on our respective health and well-being, is that something that you can see has a really tangible, positive impact on people's health and how they are? I think, I think it does. I think, I think one of the biggest things it can help with is, is, is mental health. And whether you like it or not, right, I think we, whatever age you are, you've all, everybody's experienced that, they, that everybody wants affirmation at some point in their life. Everybody wants to be told, here, that was quite good. Or everybody wants a round of applause at some point, right? And it does wonders for the confidence. <laughs> so, and the arts is the place where it's all right to applause people. <laughs> like if you work, if you work in any other profession, it's a bit weird to, to just start to start clap. Like if we work in, in in accounts in somewhere like that, it's weird. And I, but I bet you that accountant would love a round of applause. <laughs> And it does wonders for for your self confidence, and so I, I I just think the more kids, young folk are exposed to the arts, and they have an opportunity where somebody that doesn't doesn't feel that they're getting affirmation somewhere in their life, go try the arts, and they might be absolutely brilliant at it. But it also doesn't matter if they're no. They, they, everybody should experience a round of applause, and it's it's not vanity. It's it's it, you go oh my god, it, and it, and it I don't know it makes. When I first experienced it when I was younger, it made me feel invincible, and very few other things did that. Well, I think on that point, we should give Jack a round of applause for this great <laughs> point. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're now going to open to the floor for questions. Well. Um, if you'd like to ask Jack a question, please raise your hand and keep it raised until the mic is passed to you. Um, it would be helpful if we can... I'm going to try and get in, in as many questions as we possibly can. So if we can just make sure that we're all letting others have opportunities to take part. I'm going to come to... We've got two, two hands up here near the front, or roving mic. Um, so one at the front here, and then another two or three rows back. Um, is that what... Oh, yes. As somebody who does Amdram, what, a lot of what you said there just totally resonated in terms of the collective. Anyway, that's not what I wanted to ask about. I'm really interested in terms a lot of actors, particularly from work, more working class backgrounds, have talked recently about the, the lack of working class actors coming through and that acting is perhaps now more of a, a sort of middle class domain. And I just wondered if that's your experience and if it is... Are there things that we can do to make sure that we get more um, diversity within the acting profession? I mean, uh, for me, that question. So, so I, I, I was, I was very fortunate in many ways that I'd, I, I had. Uh, my my mum and dad worked their back backsides off to to help me and my brother do what we do, and it's you know sometimes there's certainly certainly when it comes to the Bali world. You know, the, there's there's a lot of travelling and things like that. So, there, but it does it does cost money. It can cost money, but it can oh, you can do it without doing it that way. Every every time I work on a production, whether it's a film or a play, like I'm working, there's there's people that have gone to private schools and had every chance under the sun and everything for them, and people that have gone that, that haven't had any of those opportunities, and they both seem to be arriving at the same point. 
Now, at the beginning, at the grassroots level, I think there definitely isn't the same uh, access to stuff like that, which is why drama, dra- not just drama, you know, like music and the arts, art in general, but drama should become a sort of, a, something that is offered to children anywhere. It should be in state schools from in the same way that, you know, I, I remember being at primary school and being taught French, you know, but not taught drama. And both of them have equal importance. Um, so I think that the only way to do that is to make sure it's in national curriculum. That's the only real way. You can try and look for more money and more subsidy into, into sort of community projects that do it. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a place in Derby that has seemed to, at one point, produce some of the best actors working in the UK all of a sudden. There's a director called Shane Meadows, a brilliant filmmaker, and all these actors came out of nowhere because he just started to run a free, you know, uh, workshop, I think. And I've worked with about five of them. Uh, Jack O'Connell, Ashley Loftus, I've, I've worked with them. Um, but at the same time, I've worked with people that, you know, have gone, like, Eton and Cambridge and blah, 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 blah. Um, I think the important thing is, is that, that I, I, went to, I went to a state school, both state schools, and... I was just happened to be very lucky to go to the school that had, it didn't have drama at that point. I had a music teacher that really liked putting on big shows, so that was lucky. And also, like I say in, in the borders, amateur operatics, where I was, I was on, I was stood on stage with like retired policemen, teachers, everybody. Um, and like, that's, that is, I think we paid, I can't remember, it's been so long now, I think you paid a Jew, you did pay some kind of Jews or something like that. Um, but that they're absolutely what I'd always be careful of is because that point is brought up quite a lot is that it is it, that there is an issue but that is an issue in every walk of life I think that's an issue in every other profession in terms of those that are given the means and what, what I sometimes get scared about when, that, when we talk about that point is that it makes people who do come from backgrounds that don't have the, the large resources of money is that they feel they feel they, they write it off and they go we can't go into it because it's for rich folk and it really really isn't it really isn't talent in in our industry will always out there's pe- people we've got brilliant people that work in our industry that are looking for people that are out there looking for people but um i i truly think the only way to do it is stick it stick it alongside science and maths <laughs> for sure. yeah, thank you in a way a question down here. Hello, Jack. Um, you've played quite a number of real people, including characters like Tony Benn and Kenneth Noy, who I think were both still alive at the time you played them. So I wondered if you'd ever had a chance to meet and talk to someone who you were about to act. And also, are there any real-life characters around now that you would love to get the chance to be one day? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> no, I've never met anyone I've played. Um, a lot of them are dead. <laughs> um, I've played... Uh, well, maybe I have. No, I, play, I met Tony Benn's son. Uh, what was he called? Yeah. Hilary Benn. I met Hilary. I've met him. I've met descendants of... Or relatives of Eric Liddell. I did meet. Um, but in the main, no, I've, I've, not, I've, I've not met anybody, really, that I've, that I've played. I, I don't know what that's like. It'd be bizarre. Um, I remember did a film called Denial about um, Deb. I think she was called Deborah Lipstadt, who was the woman that fought David Irving, the Holocaust denier guy. That that story, which was absolutely fascinating, and she, the real Deborah was on set with Rachel Vice. Uh, for judge, it was just bizarre that, and uh, but Rachel seemed to want her there. Um, so I don't know if I would advise it meeting the people that you're playing. I I never really think about the people that I'm if I'm playing real people. I don't really think about them. I try and play the person on the page. Um, because the last thing I want, it's a, it sounds a really sort of self-indulgent thing to say, but I don't want any responsibility. <laughs> because, because I'm just an actor. I just, I just like pretending to be different people. And I, and I ultimately, initially, I did this for myself. Because I was saying this to someone earlier, was like... There's no romantic story about how I became an actor, really. It's, I, I actually realised it's what I could do rather than what I wanted to do. I do what I did want to do it, but I, 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 I worked out, I went, oh, I can do that, and I grabbed it with both hands. And I almost think that it's more, 
it's, it's sometimes it's more useful to work out what you can do than what you want. It's easy to fight, work out what you want to do. Everybody wants to go to the moon or, or whatever, but if somebody actually works out they can go to the moon, like they, <laughs> we need to protect them <laughs> saying to the moon. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, um, I've done it again, gone completely off your question. But <laughs> in terms of anybody else I want to play, no, I don't, I, no, I don't, I don't know who I want to play. I don't know. Oh, no idea. No. Oh no, there is one. There is one. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. No, I really want to play Bonnie Prince Charlie because uh, yeah. I'm a history nut. Yeah, so, we were um, having a wee discussion about that earlier, weren't yeah. we? And yeah, just how much history there is down at this part of of the town. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll watch Loads. this space. Oh, we've got another another hand up here, and then over to yourself. You've just said. Um, you can't think of people you particularly want to play. Are there any people who you would refuse to play? That's a good question. Well, that's... You should have done that. <laughs> uh, no. Because I don't... I, 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 no, there are, there, there's obviously, I, that's a very, yeah, that's a tough question to answer, obviously, for, for a multitude of reasons, but um, I do think anybody should be allowed to play anybody, is if, if that's kind of what you're going towards. I don't know. No, I was perhaps wondering, to take an extreme example, would you ever play chess? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would. I mean, I would play... I play like if it was if it was being made for the right reasons. <laughs> I think you've always got to look at what what is what is the writer or the person that's trying to make this thing trying to do with this piece. You know, you've got you know, you've got to go are they trying to promote a certain view of the world? And then you've got to ask yourself like do you want to be aligned with that view of the world? But um No, I mean I've 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 played some horrible people. I have played some horrible people. I mean, I played Lord Darnley, yeah, yeah. who was who I've kind of got a soft spot for. Them. <laughs> um, but I, but I, I've, I've played horrible people, and there is something, yeah, indulgent and cathartic about if you consider yourself or you try to maintain that you're a nice person every day, and then I get to go and play a horrible person with no consequences. I mean, that's a wonderful thing that. I would advise everybody if they can. <laughs> like, see if that's where amateur operatics come in. Like, go down and play, like, somebody, go and play, you know, Tybalt, you know, and, and try to bat a Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you'll have, <laughs> it'll be fine. But, no, I, I, it's, that's a, I feel like you want to ask another bit. <laughs> Do you? No. Who would you not play? <laughs> We'll go over to, to, to here. Hi. Um, I wondered, uh, listening to what you've said about uh, the cringe factor in Scotland, which I think is quite widespread, what difference would Scotland, or what difference do you think it would make to the arts if we had a Scottish broadcaster that was a public service broadcaster whose aim was to reflect Scotland? I don't, I don't know, because I think... Um, I'm working with a director right now, uh, Finn Den Hertog, who's, uh, he's, he's a wonderful director. And him and I both went to the Royal Conservatoire. And I was talking to him about that, I was doing this, um, and about, you know, people have very, very passionate views about, uh, in, our, in our industry, about how the arts is doing here. And he made a point about that, we, he, in his opinion, he's somebody that's worked quite extensively here, that we're very, very good at making stories about ourselves. But that shouldn't be the aim. The aim should just be we, be, we need to be very good at making stories. And that's where it needs to stop. Absolutely, we need to keep exploring all the wonderful stories that we've got here and the thousands of them in history. If I could, I would just make historical stories. <laughs> that's, that's all I'd do. But I think the first thing is developing story makers. The skills and, bre and pushing that into us as people is that it's all right to tell stories. It's all right if you get up and dance instead. It's all right if you write a song. It's, it's you know, we've been... It's a horribly sort of reductive view on, on us sometimes, I think. But, like, you know, we are wonderful... We have been wonderful engineers and thinkers and problem solvers and inventors and blah, 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 blah. We really have, and we still are, you know. 
have we been natural? Have we naturally always ran towards indulging, as we would call it? See, I've already just called it indulging. I don't know. I think we've produced wonderful writers, directors, actors, singers, songwriters. We do, um, but is it is it part of? Does it is it from the bottom of who we think we are as a country, as a people? I don't know. Um, and I think it's it can only be a good thing the more that it's encouraged. Um, and if that's one way of doing it, great. But I, I've got no answers uh, to it. But I know that storytelling is... Like, I've, I've done a couple of projects now that are based around AA. Um, the play I'm about to do and the outrun is based uh, about being an alcoholic. And so I've been to a lot of AA groups and seen a lot of AA groups. And the amazing thing about them is they're all amazing storytellers, mm -hmm. people at AA. And it's, it's amazing how little alcohol is mentioned <laughs> in an AA meeting. Because they they're, they're, they're orators, and they've learned because the whole point is to share. So they've become so comfortable, you kind of get them to shut up. <laughs> they're amazing, but it's, when you watch them, it ha it's helped them so much. And the way they frame things, we've put it in our film. Like, they're better than the writing we've come up with. And so storytelling can be so useful. Um, and, and in terms of this, the, scrin the cringe thing with the Scottish thing, I read a, there's a book called Stone Voices by Neil Asherson. 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 And I've been reading that recently. I'm, I've gotten obsessed with how we think about ourselves uh, up here. And um, he writes a line where he's all, he said something where he said, in Scotland, the young are encouraged to get on, but never quite forgiven for having gotten on. <laughs> and I was like, wow, yeah. I was like, it's amazing to think about it in that way. Um, so I'm not saying that we all, you know, that we all need to walk about, you know, like we can take anything on, you know. But um, I think the arts is a way of sort of, of, of breeding that a bit more to, to, you know, to be, for us all to be okay with being good at stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Again, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> They're great questions and great answers. I think um, I was involved in the International Culture Summit, which we've held in the Parliament over years, and we had you know, a very high hegen from Microsoft in, the last one that I was involved in. And you know, one of the questions for him is, what are you looking for from the next generation or from those we're educating now? And he said, uh, you know, it's, it's similar to that, we know that we're good at inventing and so on and so forth. He was, content, it's all about content. People want to hear stories and see stories but they don't exist if we're not sharing them and if we're not developing the skills that let people do that most effectively and it was the last thing I expected to hear from an IT yeah, right, you, know, right, yeah, you know I was yeah, yeah. expecting some technical discussion but he said it's all about the story um, and I think you've just been expressing that very well oh, thanks. as long as you think that yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so more questions I know we have many hands. I'm going to go to, can I go to the back first and then I'll come to, to yourself down here. Thanks. Hi, Jack. Scott McKay from the Scottish Youth Film Foundation. All right. Um, we are sort of, we know you well. Congratulations on your wedding and all that. Um, <laughs> on, th on things, just on what you're saying about storytelling, we try and create storytellers and we always say, we're sort of somewhat supported by the Sean Connery Foundation. And we always say, what if Sean Connery had actually listened to the people around about him instead of coffin polisher? <laughs> what, what kind of a loss would that have been? So on that and going on, if you weren't a storyteller, Jack, what would your job have been <laughs> if you weren't what you are now? If you'd, if you'd listened to people who said, don't do that, if you'd listened to that inner voice, what do you think you would have become? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a strange one to say. It's, uh, nobody told me that I couldn't do it. Which, I, it, 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 not until you're older and then you're doing it and you turn back and go, oh, wow, is do you appreciate? And nobody told me. And I'm, I'm not talking about, like, it, it, it was, I was about 14 at high school and everybody was just like, right, he's going to be an actor. And it, and it was sort of normal. And I didn't until I was... till you meet other people who are actors um, and they had a totally different experience. Um, do, do, do I appreciate how lucky I was just to be dumped in a group of people that didn't really care? They just were like, aye, off you go, like, whatever. Um, 
I do remember one teacher when he when he uh, when I said I wanted to be an actor, and he went ooh like that. <laughs> And I was like, you know, and, and that's what I mean. You're like, oh, like, why? You know, um, he did, he did. He was a history teacher. Um, uh, but I, 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 I don't know what I would... I honestly don't know what I'd be doing if I hadn't done that. Um, I'm, I'm unbelievably... And my brother, I know I can speak on behalf of my brother, he's here. I can speak on behalf of him as well, is that I don't know what me and him would have done if we hadn't found the arts. I don't know. I've, I've got no idea. We would have found something to do, but we, we were both very... Sh Maybe it's just a Loudon thing and it's no Scottish, but we were very shy. <laughs> Me and my brother were very shy. Me, way shyer than him. Um, and for some reason, being in the arts and being on stage in front of people, it makes no sense whatsoever, but that's where we felt most comfortable. And I've done a lot of thinking about why that is, and I've seen a lot of youngsters who are shy and all of a sudden they're in, on a stage in front of people, and all of a sudden they feel more comfortable. And it is because there, I think it is because there is a sort of agreed contract all of a sudden that I'm here, there's lights, yous are all watching. And it, it's bred for a moment of look at me. And whereas, like, I even find it difficult when I'm in, on film sets, is that I, I was saying this to someone earlier, is that I find it weird to act on film sets because it feels like I've gone up to like a construction site. <laughs> and, and, and going, can you all stop? I want to do some Hamlet. <laughs> you know, and like it, the, that that con that imaginary contract isn't there. And the amount of young people, the amount of actors, also grown actors that I meet that are painfully shy people, yeah, it was like getting blood out of stone. And then camera goes on, or they're on stage, and they're like, and I'm like, I don't understand it, but it's something happened. Someone made the point to me about it's like. It's not the same thing, but it's like when people have stammers or stutters and they sing. Like, I went to the same school as Kelly Brown, the ex-Scotland captain, rugby Scotland captain. Kelly's got a speech impediment. As soon as Kelly sings, sings it disappears. And it's bizarre. It's something about that's very it's releasing about it, whereas to most people, it would be their worst nightmare to be sat or stood in front of someone singing. Um, so... I honestly, I don't know what I'd be like as a person if I didn't have the arts. I think I'd still, I'd be a wee, I'd be, I'd be a shell, you know. I, I would be, because somebody gave me a nod across a room, of of, of affirmation, and I found my sort of my my home is on a stage. Even I walk into a theatre and I smell a theatre, I relax. The rest of the time, I'm a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mess. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Another hand here. just discovered you through Slow Horses, so apologies for that. We'll catch us in your back catalogue. But um, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, first-class television, I, I think. Thank you. When you read the script, did you know it was a winner? And do you know what happens at the end? Why did I tell you that? Did you know it was a winner? <laughs> but did you know it was a winner? Yeah. I, I knew it was. I think... Um, it's quite funny that uh, the thing that attracted me to it was how severely cynical and sarcastic the character was, because uh, I find that very easy <laughs> uh, <laughs> to lean towards. And I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. That's the other thing about that point. I'm very proud of our of our natural feet on the floor, you know, heeding the clowns, but heeding the clouds, but feet on the floor that we have up here, and the sort of cynicism, healthy cynicism that we have. Sometimes it does my head in, but sometimes it's quite healthy. And he, River, has that has. Uh, he's very, very sarcastic, and I just knew when I read it that I, there was not—I'd never seen anything like it. And I knew that it hit a sweet spot that would eventually—it would, it would be a slow burn, which is also one of the, the. If it had been on BBC, it probably would have gone like that. And that's the world of streaming that we live in now. You know, people have to find shows now. People—I don't know if you all noticed that, but. You're getting, it's bizarre, you're getting recommendations. It's like the old days of by word of mouth. You're getting more of that because there's so much content. Um, but I, I knew it was. It's, it's brilliantly written and anything funny. And it's also hugely recognisable, I think, even though it's about spies, is that it also, it's a work-based drama. And a lot of people can recognise being in an office, being bored or having a horrible boss. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I knew it was, yeah. Here 
we were talking about. Oh, sorry, carry on. Do I know carry on. No, I really don't. No, because he's because the author's not stopped writing. He won't stop writing books. <laughs> so it, it hasn't ended yet. <laughs> but no, no it, idea. It's Chatham House rules. What's said in this room stays in this room. <laughs> no, no, chat. I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We've tried. I've, I've got no idea. <laughs> no, no idea. <laughs> Yeah, please do. Thank you. Um, a lot of actors, uh, Scottish actors, move to London or America to get roles, but you stayed in Scotland. Do you find that that restricts or inhibits the types of roles you get offered? No, I mean, I, I initially uh, I initially went down to London because, and, and that was quite a long time ago now, 14 years ago, I, d I did Black Watch for the National Theatre of Scotland. I was very lucky that I got Black Watch. Mm -hmm. I saw, now there's an example, right, before, did that again, going away on a tangent, but it is linked. Black Watch, I was taken to see Black Watch by my English teacher at Edelson High School, Miss Kitchener, she was called then, I think she's remarried, or she's married. <laughs> um, uh, but she took us to see the uh, Black Watch at the Grass Market in Glasgow, and it was, the, the way that they do it in Traverse, it's called Traverse Theatre, so it's like, it was based on the tattoo, the Seaton Banks. And so I was sat in the front row, and most theatres like this, I've never understood that, why you go and see a play and you're like, it doesn't make any sense. So here, at, at Black Watch, there was a soldier, a guy playing one of the soldiers who had PTSD, he was an actor called Ali Craig, and he was stood there when I was 16, and I could see him, see in his eyes, and this actor had managed to transform himself into somebody that looks like they're suffering from PTSD. And I was completely transfixed. I'd never been that close to an actor. And the way the music, and anybody that's been lucky enough to see that play, it was a magnificent watershed moment in Scottish culture. Um, and that play made me, want, made me go, nah, I really want to do this. If I hadn't been taken to that, I probably would have still wanted to become an actor. But seeing something like that, that, that was that good, and that's the other key bit. It's not just about getting the wains into the arts. Like we can get, we, everybody says that about every different aspect in life, getting the kids doing this, is that we've also got to have ambition to be really, really good at it. Because if you're really, really good at it, then you'll make folk, mere folk want to do it. And, the, and it will grow and grow and grow. And that was an example of something that was really, really, really good. Um, and that wasn't your question. <laughs> <laughs> and your question was... was you're, you're to moving to London. Sorry, and Black Watch, yes. I, from that, I got an agent in London and I moved to London because that was what you did. That's just what you did. Um, because that's where the majority of the work was. That's where all the agents were. They still are. And what changed was... Um, uh, Zoom, Skype, mm -hmm. cameras, technology. Now you don't necessarily have to be down in London or anywhere in particular to audition, to meet you and kids. Young actors are now becoming encouraged to become incredibly proficient with filming themselves and they can send it off. So I, I believe that, that it is more possible than ever now that if you're from... You know, if you're from the borders, if you're from if you're from Lockerbie, if you're from Dundee, if you're from wherever, you can, you know, because it is a big, it's a, it's so expensive to live there, you can do it more now, um, and but I also think that is a great, there's a it's a double edged sword because it's wonderful to go off somewhere else, mm -hmm. and that's the problem that Scotland's had to deal with forever since the beginning of time, you know, that we want to go, we're great travellers, and but but. Mm -hmm. Both have benefits. Stay in the one place and do it all in one place. I wouldn't say that for anybody. It doesn't matter if it's Scotland or not. If you've got the means to, if you've got the ability to get out and go somewhere else, absolutely. I think as long as, as long as, um, it's, it, to me, it, I, I want to do work here. But that's me. That's me. That might not be everybody. But I've, I've seen work around the world. And I love the idea of using what I've learned and found and do it here. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so who else has a question? We have one up here. Thank you. Let's get that mic along there. So are you enjoying this? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you? Oh, no, no I, 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 I'm enjoying it. People are, 
Instagram. It's like they're moderating themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous. It's a holiday for you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you talked about kind of a combination of screen and stage. Uh, this one's a question is a bit more directed towards screen. What has your perspective been over the past kind of like 10, 15 years as the development's gone from kind of scheduled programming to like streaming sites and kind of the la like the industry itself has kind of really changed in the way that work is made? What's your experience of that been? I mean, I, th I think uh, I, th I think it's th th the way that the industry moves is the way that the world moves. And I think whatever, uh, you know, it's, you, you're asked quite often as actors now, do you feel bad that people are watching films and TV things on their phones or on their iPads instead of in cinemas? You're asked that quite often as actors because of the move away from traditionally, you know, whatever, even as, you know, 40, 30, 40 years ago, the only way to watch a movie was in the cinema um, and that cinemas are closing and cinema is dying and, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fair point but also if the work, if, if it means a whole generation of people are going to watch the work that you've made but it means they watch it on their iPhone, I don't really care because the important thing is that they're watching it, that they're, that they're getting something from it. Um, so I don't think that they're a, a bad thing, streamers, I will always speak, you know, when I'm thinking as an actor, there's mere jobs <laughs> and, and actors are never going to complain about that. Um, there's more, I think there's more money spread around. There's more avenues to get money, to get funding for certain things now with streamers um, because it's just built and built and built. I don't think that it's a bad thing, streaming at all. I think traditional TV still exists, cinema still exists, it's hanging on by a thread, and I think, I, I would be scared if cinema became like, you know, going 10 pin bowling, where it's like something you used to do, you know, if it became like a treat, like a sort of, ooh, like going to jousting or something. <laughs> I'd be scared if that's what happened to it, but I don't necessarily think it's something that we have to fight tooth and nail in our industry, you know, that no, oh, people are watching stuff on their, it doesn't matter. You know, but I'm not a purist. There's purists that would sl smack me, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. Do we... Yeah, we have another hand up here. Do you find any... You, you know, when you're working for something that's going to be streamed or a more traditional broadcast medium, is there any significant differences? Um, d d no, I mean... Again, I, d I don't really think about that side of stuff uh, at all, really, as, as an actor you're just sort of thankful for the job and you're thankful to do stuff. Um, there, you know, there's having produced now as well and seeing that side of stuff and the amount of hoops that have got to be jumped through for anything to be made is that when, I, you know, I remember I produced the, film, produced the outrun and then I went back and shot, I had to shoot more of the um, slow horses and I remember being near the tent where the director and the producers were and just sort of loving the fact that I didn't have to worry about anything other than <laughs> did my hair look good. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I got bored of that, and then I want to produce a film again. So, um, no, I, I don't think about who it's being made for, ever, really, not. Just do your job. I just, yeah, you're a hired gun, <laughs> sort of, yeah. Question here. Uh, hey, Jack, uh, I'm Louis. Uh, I attend Earlston High School. Yes. And <laughs> Uh, I was involved in the show, Singing in the Rain. Uh, oh, were you? Yeah, oh, right, right. people loved your cameo in it. <laughs> uh, but now that it's finished, I feel like there's, um, well, there's a massive gap now. So I was wondering, how do you keep yourself occupied in the arts when there's nothing going ar on around you? You mean a massive gap after the summer show's finished? Well, yeah. 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 I used to see my mum will attest to that is that when the school show would finish at Erlston, I, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was, I was just, I just sit, um, because that's an example of the buzz that you can feel. The buzz is, is addictive. It really is amazing, um, and so I, I would always get really down after the, after the show would be over. Um, so not to make it sound worse, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, good luck. No, I think, I think if it depends what you're into. I think you know, if 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 you want to make films, if you like films, it's like any filmmaker worth their salt will tell you. And you kids, 
now have no excuse whatsoever with phones and technology. It's go and make, just make films, shoot things. When I was in COVID, during, during COVID, um, I, you know, I'm a 30, 31 year old grown man. I was making stupid videos on my phone of mime. <laughs> I got into mime in a big way. <laughs> of like, I was making, I, 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 love, I want to bring mime back. <laughs> and, I, and I made videos, I sh I, I, and I did a thing for, uh, Edith Bowman got me involved in a thing for, it was about, it was raising money for PPE, yeah. some, something of Scotland, forget it now. Uh, Joanna Vanderham's mum was involved, uh, who's a nurse, I think. Um, and, it, and she asked a bunch of artists to put something together. And I loved it. I made a sort of mock spoof of the opening of Trainspotting. <laughs> but it was about, you can find it. I'm very proud of it. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually the best thing I've ever made. <laughs> and and, I, and, and I, I went a bit, you know, I found a treadmill and it did it like it was like the running streets, the shop with their feet running on, down Princess Street. <laughs> and I did it with my, you know. And they edited it all together and... and and it kept juices flowing, and I actually got better at what I did. And I had my, my now wife, I had, she was getting really annoyed because I kept asking her to film different bits. <laughs> Go on, film me doing this. Um, so it, the answer is that you keep, do, you keep doing it. With stage, I think it's, it's, it's go and see plays, you know, if you can. Go and see plays. If not, you know, watch stuff on TV. But just consume. Consume, consume, consume. Watch as many films as you can. Get it, get it, get it, because then you, you will, even, even if you're not very good, you will inevitably build up a library of what you know looks good and what doesn't. And you'll have a knowledge. The best people I've ever worked with are, have had their, have their heads full of films, books, references. They are, the, they are the people that know what they're doing. Become obsessed with it in a healthy way. <laughs> yeah. right, you heard it here. <laughs> Healthy obsessions. Um, we have a hand right up the back there. Oh, we have a couple. Some hands at the back there. Get that to you. Um, I'm from the Highlands, where there's a strong oral storytelling tradition. Um, but a lot of the older storytellers I work to, the people I'm apprenticed to, um, they are in despair over oral storytelling. They feel that people aren't showing up as much and that there's less interest. Um, do you think, in a world with so many types of storytelling, whether that be film or TV or video games or graphic novels, that oral storytelling has a place and can survive? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Anything's possible, you know, it's one of the great, I think, you know, everybody flip-flops, it's one of the great evils of the world, but then it's also, become, it's also one of the great wonders is with social media and things like that, is that things like oral sto storytelling, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound stupid, but, I, you know, I, every, everybody who's got social media gets caught looking at something for about 15 minutes and they come up and they go, and go what have you been doing? I've been just watching a guy making bread for 15 minutes. <laughs> something that they never thought existed. Something that they never thought. So something like the, the, the Gallic oral storytelling culture is something that, to me, all of these things that are slightly being lost are things that you, sh we sh you shouldn't put anything to the side. You shouldn't write anything off any way that can help it. And never be too proud of exploring these 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 other ways of communicating and getting things across to people. I think I've I, I've I've spent a lot of time up in up in the Highlands. We we were on the Isle of uh, we were on Barra um, about three four years ago. I actually got like we got lo locked down in this because um, of a storm. We got and I watched Whiskey Galore, the original Whiskey Galore. Um, and so I, I, I started showering myself in, in uh, literature from up, up around there and stuff like that. And I became obsessed with, th was it not also what they used to do in the clans? They used to have people that would recite the lineage of people. Mm -hmm. And that is that where that sort of come from? It's sort of like they could, they could it just turn to they go, right, Davy, do it. And, da and Davy would, rabbit, would reel off the sort of like hundreds and hundreds of generations of one person's family. 
um, he would just like do it at the, at the beginning of a battle, <laughs> which I just find amazing. I, I find that absolutely extraordinary. Like, so if I saw that, for example, if I saw someone like that doing that, it sounds so stupid, this, but if I sound, saw it on Instagram one day, I'd become obsessed with it. You know, we feed our, our brains have changed because of things like that, and it's not for the better always. But if, if, the, if the aim is survival of something, it should adapt as best it can to how people consume things, I really think, and not be too precious about it. Some things that's possible with and some things it's not, but I think something like that, because the, 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 I, I, I've seen a few of those, they, they, it's, it's amazing, it's beautiful, that, 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 that version of storytelling, because they have that in where I'm from, the Border Ballads kind of did the same thing, I was there was a Border Reaver project at one point that uh, that I sort of was sniffing around, and they had a Border Ballad in it, and I didn't know about the board, Border Ballads coming from the borders till I left the borders. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I think it's a gorgeous tradition that we need to absolutely bring back. Yeah. I'm sure we have a few more questions in the audience. Please don't be shy. Um, in the meantime, I'll I'll come to yourself in a minute. Can I just ask? Are you how difficult is it for you to decide that you want to be involved in something or not? Do you know instantly? Do you sometimes take a bit of persuasion? Are, is, there, is there too much for you to do? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I won't, I've been doing this uh, 14 years now. I've only very recently got into a stage where I can be really picky. Um, and actually, as an activist, it's the only stage I really wanted to get to is, was, was to sort of that I could choose what I do. Because um, I think it's a really that's a privilege as an actor because ninety nine percent of actors you know don't get to do that and I spent a long time doing that and um, so I enjoy that now but it's it can vary from project to project um, if it's a director who I've been obsessed with uh, you know I'll, I'll it doesn't even matter what the story is I'll just do it because it's one ingredient um, is enough for me to do something absolutely yeah there's a question here there's there's two up here. If we just go to to that one first, and then oh yeah, thank you. Hi, I know you recently got involved with the reopening of the Edinburgh Film House. I was just wondering what your relationship with the film house is, and how you got involved with the reopening. They, they, I, I just said something once at an award ceremony, and they, they asked me if I wanted to supporting them which I said obviously I would um, they, it's they, they've got an incredible team of people that have managed to pull that back from the brink um, to, to, to keep something like that open in this day and age like we were talking about earlier is quite an achievement um, and I th I'm a patron I don't necessarily I'm quite scared about what that means but I'm, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't I, I'm yet I'm yet to go to the building um, because I've, I've, I've just been too busy I haven't actually been there yet but the fact that that was saved um, was wonderful uh, any kind of center any kind of hub of, of when it comes to creative the creative arts is is really useful it's because you can point at it and go it's real and people feel you know it's there so I, I I'm so proud of the fact that they did that. I don't know what they want me to do now, um, <laughs> but if it means keeping it open, I, you know, there's very little I would need to, because <laughs> it's so important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And in the road just ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you. I don't think you've been on Desert Island just yet. But what would your luxury item be on a desert island? My luxury item. I thought about this the other day. Have you planned this? No. Can you say Radio 4? <laughs> Can you say that? That is genuinely what I'd want. <laughs> there's a, like, there's a, do you ever, see, anyone ever saw, um, it's a comedy, niche comedy called The Thin Blue Line with Rowan Atkinson, mm -hmm. there's a bit of cop, and he says that at one point, he goes, someday I wish I could run off and live somewhere on Radio 4. <laughs> and I think I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Like, whenever things get too much, I just want to run and live somewhere on Radio 4, I don't know where that is. Um, that would be my answer. <laughs> Got another hand, just yeah, just where you've come from. So just yeah, step count yeah. increasing. Hi, I wanted to know how um, what you like doing in your spare time. How do you relax? 
Do you like listening to music? What's your musical tastes? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, uh, what I like to do to relax, um, I'm rubbish at that, relaxing for a start. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with history. I read, I read quite a lot of historical books, I'll, and I'll also read. I'm, I'm not good at. I have to read a book wherever I'm, wherever I am. So a book that's set where I am, even between the Highlands and the Lowlands, I can't read a book set in the borders in Perth. You know, I can't, <laughs> yeah, it's not the Highlands, but. I can't, I have to, I, I, I was in Italy recently and I read a book about the Medici, um, which was just incredible. Um, so I, I, I just consume history. I was born in the wrong era, absolutely. I want to live in the 1700s, which probably would be a stupid idea. Um, but, uh, so I read a lot of history. I read, I read an incredible amount of Scottish history. It's about two or three years ago I sort of, I ch challenged myself with, trying to learn as much about home as possible and all the different views and all the different things that's happened um, because our, sometimes the view of, of, our, of our country is sort of prescribed by others or, or whatever in a generation to generation. So I really wanted to throw everything into my head um, as much as I could. And I read, uh, I read Andrew O'Hagan. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with Andrew O'Hagan's novels um, and, and a anything historical. That's kind of what I do, or Mun uh, Munro's, but I've only done 12. <laughs> um, so I need to do more. Um, we, 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 the other day, me and a bunch of friends sort of cleared uh, a bit of my garden. I like to... <laughs> 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 I, 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 and I watch as many films as I can. I really do. It's, uh, that's a sort of teacher's pet answer, but... Yeah, yeah that's about it, really. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about Munro's, I believe one of your most recent projects you were filming in The Pentlands. Yeah. And you were saying it was somewhat chilly? It was, and the, the unit, this is what I love about how t t more stuff is being made here, is the unit base was in Carlops. And I was like, eh? <laughs> <laughs> like, I shot film, I shot uh, Tommy's Honour, a golf film, that, that I did with Peter Mullen when I was about 24, 25, and the unit base was in Dalkeith. <laughs> and I was like, the, I, I, I was like, you know, you're you're brought up to think that the film industry is in Hollywood and all this kind of stuff. And to see it here, I was like, why couldn't it be? Why can't it be here? And so, I we took over the village hall in Carlops, the pub that's been out of action there apparently for a while. We took that over as a production office, um, and we were, I we were up in the up in the Pentlands in January, <laughs> shooting me and Tim Roth running about. Freezing. He kept sitting in his car, though. <laughs> Whereas I, I felt I had to prove something, so I was, <laughs> stood like that yeah, in a warm coat. Yeah. But yeah. I'm really Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, yeah. I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a, a, any chance. Any time I get to shoot some somewhere here, um, I, f I feel unbelievably lucky. And I, I, I the, like at the moment the play that I'm doing, it's bounced. It's now. It was in Dundee. It's now coming to. The Lyceum, and I, I, I've never, I honestly, God, I've never been happier than right now doing this play here and being home, being around those that I love and, and being around where I love and travelling between, like driving past Stirling Castle because a history nut like me, every time I look, go past that castle, I just look at it. <laughs> this, I think it's got a very handsome silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's got a more handsome silhouette than Edinburgh Castle. Oh, no. <laughs> I think it does. It's got a, I don't know. Depends which side, but... Yeah. Well, we'll set up a Twitter poll. <laughs> <laughs> There's at the back there. Um, given your love of historical novels, uh, Sir Walter Scott, good or evil for Scotland? <laughs> oh. Ah, come on, like... <laughs> So I've never read a Walter Scott, uh, and I should. I, I, I'm a Robert Louis Stevenson man. Um, I became obsessed with Kidnapped, um, and I've even stood outside his window down there. Um, uh, Walter Scott, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know enough about Walter Scott. I know what the, I know. There's an, a there's a huge opinion over there, and there's a huge opinion over here about Walter Scott. I know which one I'm probably angling towards, um, but. It's a great question about, you know, how useful was he? At, you know, he, he very much rubber-stamped us as something to the world. 
but like how much did he know how much was he aware that that was going to be how everybody then viewed Scotland and then you've got to ask yourself what have we gained from that versus what we've lost um, and I think that discussion could go on for ages and I just didn't want to get in trouble <laughs> <laughs> um, but because uh, the minute I breathe anything, somebody up here will be like, oh, he's this. Uh, anyway, um, I, sh I shouldn't be that scared. Anyway, but, but, what, but I, I, think, um, I think he helped himself a lot. <laughs> I think he did, and I think he... Um, I still haven't read anything, but I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He's got, I, mean, he's got, I mean, he's got a whopping big monument to him. <laughs> I, but I think, I think other people should have bigger monuments, to be honest. Yeah. 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 No, it's like it's just such a, an iconic part of Princess Street in Edinburgh in Scotland, isn't it? And yeah, and at the heart of it all is a, yeah. is a writer. I tell you what I am thankful for him for is that he gave the name to my favourite breed of dog, Dandy Dinman. <laughs> um, uh, in our family, we, uh, we have Dandy Dinman dogs. They're the greatest little things, they were, and they're bred in the borders. And I think that was the name of a shepherd in one of his novels. Um, and it's the most brilliant name for a breed of dog I've ever heard. See, so, yeah, I'll give him that. <laughs> look at this conversation. It's, it's covering a lot of bases. It's here at the front, please, if you'd have a mic. Thank you. Just here. You mentioned Gary Oldman eats a lot of ice cream before Slow Horses. You, on the other hand, have to run a lot. Um, how do you prepare? Do you hate the days when you spend all day running around London? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do because it's normally at about three o'clock in the morning in a, di in, a, in a tube station that we've taken over. So, um, and like I've said recently, and it is true, is it's mainly always downstairs, which is a... You're, Body's not built to do that, and you don't look cool running downstairs, because your body, go, my brain goes, do you do 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 do, do or do you do 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 do? do? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what one's better, so I find it quite a challenge, it's like a Sudoku, <laughs> when I'm running downstairs. But um, yeah, I have to. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of running, and Gary's just sat on his back, <laughs> sat on his backside eating something. <laughs> Um, but I, I, get, I, I'm, I get to do such cool stuff. I mean, when we shot the first season, I think it was probably because it was still around COVID, but we got a whole uh, terminal of Stansted Airport given to the production because there was nobody flying anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we got about four or five planes, and so I got to drive drive a pickup truck under. I mean, what? You know, they don't teach you that at Scottish Youth Theatre. <laughs> <laughs> But, but Scottish Youth Theatre led to me doing that, so thank you. But they, um, I was, we were doing things like that and, and, and you know, running through the back, back room, backstage of an airport, like the luggage carousels and stuff. So I, I've gotten to do some great stuff, really have. Um, but, yeah, Gary, Gary just... <laughs> Gary, Gary just eats, he just eats. He'll send me pictures of things he's eating while I... <laughs> Well, I'm like, ah, in the gym. I'm like, ah, I'm like, ah. Yeah, yeah, he's very lucky, but he's earned it. <laughs> he's more than earned it, yeah. So in the next series, should we be looking at more sort of up? Upstairs. Upstairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, that, they'll have read, the producers will have read that in an article now, and they'll be like, if you want upstairs, you can have upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Okay, well, is there anything you'd like to tell us about what we'll be seeing you in next? Uh, so, yeah, so the, the, I think it's sold out here, but the play, David Ireland's play, um, is absolutely brilliant. He's one of my favourite playwrights. Um, very, very funny, very dark. Um, not for the faint-hearted, but great. I think there's still tickets left in Glasgow if anybody wants to see it. So go, because it's, it's, a, it's an experience seeing one of his plays. Um, and then, yeah, and then Slow Horses comes out again in about a couple of weeks. Um, and then John McLean's film and a Jim Brooks film that I did, which was amazing. That was an amazing experience. And was there a political angle to that film? It's set in a young governor's office in a state in America. It's an imaginary state. 
and she becomes governor overnight from deputy to governor. Mm. She has to fill those shoes. And I play, again, <laughs> I play the sort of feckless husband <laughs> <laughs> to somebody brilliant, which, which I love doing. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I, you know, you know, I try not to do that in life. So <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah, so that and then, and then, yeah, that's sort of it at the moment. Um, but um, I'm very excited about John McLean's film. Um, and seeing the Pentlands on screen. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, well, I'm sure we will all be tuning in to all of that and, and watching with interest, and I think it's fair to say we've all learned a great deal. <laughs> no, from your contribution this afternoon, I, I mean, thank you so much for taking the time out of an incredibly busy schedule to be here in the Parliament. It means a great deal to us. You know, obviously, culture is... Well, you know, it's it's a devolved matter. It's one that's debated here day in, day out. And to, to hear from a Scottish actor, you know, that, that so many of us are watching and, and relating to, it's just been truly fabulous. And I think I, I often say one of the great privileges in this job is the amount of varied things I have to do. And I know that everyone here this afternoon has really appreciated the time that you've given us and your willingness to answer a range of very diverse questions. So thank you all so much for, for your contribution. But... You know, thank you very much indeed to you, Jack. My pleasure. Thank you. Can I just thank to our partners, the Scottish Youth Film Foundation, thank you very much for all that you do. And can I just remind you all, we were discussing dance earlier... There will be a, there's a special free event outside today at four o'clock and there are over 250 dancers, pipers and musicians taking part in the Healing Arts Scotland opening celebration. I hope to get out there myself and it'd be lovely to, to see you out there. And we have, we'll be covering a full range of topics as the week of Festival of Politics goes ahead. We'll be discussing AI, housing, the US elections... Um, and much more. So you'd be very welcome to join us at, at any and all of those events. But thank you again for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.